Digital Good Day to all our attendees online. I would like to welcome you to the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology's second Digital Annual Congress. Welcome you all to the 2021 Annual Meeting of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology. I now declare the 2021 Annual Meeting of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology officially open.
Digital Good Day to all our attendees online. I would like to welcome you to the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology's second Digital Annual Congress. Welcome you all to the 2021 Annual Meeting of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology. I declare the 2021 Annual Meeting of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology officially open. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back after a two-week hiatus to the PAO Online Research Bootcamp. I know that almost everyone is tired from yesterday's event, but I hope we can all concentrate for two hours today, then get some rest afterwards. I am Rainer Kuvar, and I will serve as your moderator this morning. We have been receiving very good reviews about the business bootcamp from the participants. I hope you guys are enjoying these sessions as well as, as, well as I am. Today is the fourth and last session for module one on evidence-based medicine. We will be discussing an important and relevant topic, which is critical appraisal on a systematic review, meta-analysis, and clinical practice guidelines. 
To date, the PAO has CPGs on cataract and glaucoma. The PAO Standards Committee will be working on two more CPGs this coming year, so watch out for that. Before we begin, let us congratulate our graduates who passed the written part of the PBO exam. One more exam to go, then you'll be allowed to practice ophthalmology, or maybe pursue further training and fellowship, or maybe enroll in public health for a master's degree program in clinical epidemiology. Again, as an overview of this project, this webinar series was started two years ago, designed for ophthalmologists, ophthalmology fellows, and residents in training that will focus on most nodes of research. This is divided into four, four modules where evidence-based medicine, research methods, scientific paper writing, and research opportunities in ophthalmology will be discussed in detail. Reference materials are given weekly, so you, so you can listen in, equipped with an SRI background on the topic. Last week, we discussed critical appraisal on an article in therapy. If you're not able to catch that, you can look for it at the PO Facebook Live and YouTube channel. Alternatively, the lecture notes are attached in the link where the reading materials are. We have scheduled 12 very exciting research field sessions, which will be broadcasted in the different platforms, such as Zoom and Facebook Live. Eventually, it will also be available in the PAO app. At this point, we would like to remind everyone that questions will be entertained after the end of the lecture. But for those of you who have questions, you may post these questions in the chat box and then we will get to them at the soonest possible time. Also, we'll be posting poll questions during the lectures just to make the lectures a little bit more interactive. Please don't be shy to give your answers to the questions. We just want to make sure that you understand these concepts or we're just making sure that you're also still awake. Now let us let me start by introducing our resource speaker for today and for the past few sessions. Our speaker is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, College of Public Health at UP Manila. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in epidemiology at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, USA, as a National Institute of Health Fogarty International Center Fellow. He obtained his Doctor of Medicine degree under the Intermed program from UP Manila in 2009 and his Master of Public Health degree in 2014, also from UP Manila. Let us again welcome Dr. Amil Nazer Bermudez, straight from Rhode Island, USA, to give us his lecture on critical appraisal on a systematic review, meta-analysis, and clinical practice guidelines. Hi, Amiel. Good evening. Hi, Serene. Hi, everybody. It's me again. Uh, nice to see everybody after uh... Uh, the two-week hiatus as mentioned by uh, Dr. Kovar. So we have a relatively uh, busy busy morning. Um, we'll be covering two article types, but I think the good thing here is that we don't have a workshop. So what I did was to just uh, integrate in the lecture um, some practical applications when it comes to critical appraisal. So the first, the first hour we'll talk about critical appraisal of a systematic review and a meta-analysis, and then we'll, um, pause for a break, and then we'll resume with the second lecture on critical appraisal of a clinical practice guideline. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, lecture. So this will be our session objectives. Uh, at the end of the session, you should be able to cite instances or settings when systematic reviews are appropriate. Um, differentiate a systematic review from a traditional literature review because up until now, there is a confusion. Um, people usually conflate the two. They're very different. Uh, the third would be to discuss uh, just the basic steps in conducting a systematic review. Um, conducting a systematic review is actually very difficult. It's uh, resource and labor intensive. So uh, it's, really, it's really not my aim to develop systematic reviewers out of you at the end of this lecture, but at least to introduce you to how it's uh, usually done or how it's actually done. And then the fourth would be uh, for you to interpret uh, forest plots and funnel plots, just basic interpretation. And then last would be for you to critically appraise a systematic review with or without a meta-analysis. So again, uh, just a disclaimer, this lecture is not about conducting a systematic review or a meta-analysis. We usually, usually allot uh, an entire semester for that. 
And even if you attend an entire semester course uh, of, on, on systematic reviews and meta-analysis, it's usually also not enough because you know the, the, the field of meta-analysis, for instance, is just evolving so rapidly. Yeah, but I, I, I would be very happy to answer any questions you might have about methodologic issues or any questions that may arise from the lecture. Okay, so let's start with uh, some basic concepts. First, um, this is the, the classical hierarchy of evidence. If you recall from my very first lecture, I presented this as uh, you know the, the traditional way of uh, the, the traditional way of graphically presenting the hierarchy of evidence that's generated by different studies. Okay, so um, you'll see here that if you're interested in establishing cost and effect relationships, then a randomized controlled trial would be the best study designed to address that. Okay, so if you're looking into causal effects, cost and effect relationships, then the evidence that's provided by an RCT would actually rank higher than the same evidence provided by a cohort study or a case control study or even a cross-sectional study. So if you aggregate or pool the results of several randomized controlled trials answering the same clinical question or answering the same question, then uh, your systematic review and meta-analysis will provide even a higher level of evidence. That's why you would you'd usually hear that a systematic review and meta-analysis like the platinum standard when you're looking into cause and effect relationships. But again, I'd want to point out that this is the classical hierarchy of evidence. Uh, if you recall from my first lecture, I showed you that pyramid where um, the boundaries between the study designs, for example, are wavy because let's say uh, a well-conducted cohort study might actually provide better quality of evidence than a poorly conducted randomized controlled trial. Okay. Which brings me now to this very basic definition of a systematic review. So a systematic review just summarizes the results of healthcare studies. Uh, usually your RCTs, although there are systematic reviews um, that include other study designs. Okay, so a systematic review summarizes results of available healthcare studies and provides an assessment of the level of evidence, how good the evidence is on the effectiveness of health interventions. Um, as I've mentioned, a systematic review is very complicated. It's uh, very time consuming. In my experience, even if I have, let's say, an entire army of research assistants, it, it would usually take me a minimum of six months to complete a systematic review, and it can even be longer, especially if the if there are a lot of studies to synthesize or screen. So it's complicated, and it depends largely on a lot of factors. And this would include uh, what clinical trials are available, how the trials were carried out, and then the health outcomes that were measured. Now, meta analysis, on the other hand, is the process by which uh, numerical data, so quantitative data about the effects of interven interventions are combined or pooled. So uh, this numerical data can refer to, let's say your relative risk, uh, your risk difference, for example. Uh, in some instances, I see odds ratios and prevalence ratios being reported, although uh, there's a bit of, uh, what they call this, uh, there's a bit of an error in, 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 in the choice of the odds ratio and uh, prevalence ratio when uh, data comes from uh, randomized controlled trials. So this is that's what's meant by meta-analysis. It's the process by which numerical data about the effects of your interventions are combined or pooled. Now, please take note that not all systematic reviews will include a meta-analysis. Um, it's actually, you know, there's a lot of decision that goes into this, uh, but it's very important that you understand that, you know, uh, don't force a systematic review to have a meta-analysis kung hindi talaga siya kaya. Okay, again, not all systematic reviews will include uh, a meta-analysis. Now, um, your systematic reviews are most appropriate when you're trying to address a single focused uh, question. So it's, it has to be very specific. So this is actually what differentiates it in a way from your traditional literature review, okay? You're addressing a single focused uh, question um, when there are strong studies that are available, 
but these studies are not so much in, agree in agreement with one another that the question is already answered. So it, it, it would be good to carry out a systematic review if there are uh, strong studies, well-conducted studies, well-powered studies, but these studies contradict with each other such that you still don't know what the answer to your question is. However, if there are strong studies, but these studies are essentially saying the same thing, then a systematic review may not be uh, you know, informative in this case. And then of course, you want to carry out a systematic review when there are several studies addressing the same research question. You don't want to carry out a systematic review that just yields, let's say, one article. So that would be quite sad in a way. Okay, so this table uh, shows the difference between a systematic review and a literature review. Okay, so we'll try to differentiate the two according to goals, the question, the authors, and even the value. So as I mentioned a while ago, um, a systematic review answers a focused single question. And that question is usually specified in terms of PICO. So your PICO is like your friend forever. So you specify it according to population, intervention, comparator, outcome. And in some instances, some systematic reviewers are quite selective with the studies that they include in their review. So they would like only include randomized control trials. Um, in, co uh, in contrast, your literature review is really more of a summary or an overview of a topic. So it's not even a question. It's usually a very broad topic um, that, the, that the reviewer is interested in. So for the question, uh, in a systematic review, it should be clearly defined. It should be answerable. I've mentioned this a while ago. It uses the PICO or other variation of this format. Literature review, not so much. It's usually very general, um, not, not quite specific. Now, um, in a systematic review, you need at least two authors. So I'm saying this now, you cannot carry out uh, a well-conducted systematic review um, all by yourself, okay? You, sh you should at least have two authors, sometimes with the third person who re review these agreements because, you know, there's a lot of consensus building in a way in the systematic review process. Let's say decisions about whether to include this study or not, okay? So you'd, you'd um, essentially want the two readers agree uh, on, on a particular decision, but if there's a disagreement, then you have to decide how you're going to to resolve that. And usually a third person is identified to review those disagreements and then resolve those disagreements, right? A literature review, you can actually carry out a literature re review all by yourself. I did this for my dissertation uh, project. It's quite difficult, very difficult, uh, yeah, but it's doable, okay? And nobody will fault you if you carry out a literature review all by yourself. Now, a systematic review will result in high quality evidence, as well as the systematic review was done correctly, of course, and it supports evidence-based practice. Now, a literature review, on the other hand, as the term implies, uh, provides a summary of the literature. I'm not saying that literature reviews are not important. They're very important in planning research, for example, in developing your research proposal. And in some instances, uh, a literature review is the best way to synthesize um, evidence, right? But um, a systematic review just answers, you know, a totally different uh, problem, solves a totally different problem, answers a totally different need. And that's when you're looking into high quality evidence, supporting, for example, an intervention. And of course, uh, as a guide for evidence-based practice. So um, I've mentioned this a while ago, uh, when conducting a systematic review, you should carefully consider whether it is appropriate to combine the numerical results of all or some of your studies, right? Uh, an example of an instance in which it's not appropriate for you to be combining results from several studies is when these studies are really, really very different from each other. If there is like a very stark difference in the study population that are included in these studies. So sometimes just presenting the results in a table would do. So don't force to combine them if the populations are really, really different from each other. So that's just an example. So again, as I've mentioned, not all systematic reviews will include a meta-analysis. 
as I've mentioned, a meta-analysis will, will yield a statistic, an overall statistic. So don't be scared with the term statistic. The statistic here without the S just refers, uh, for example, to your risk difference or your relative risk. So your meta-analysis will yield that, a pooled relative risk or a pooled a risk difference together with its confidence interval. And this pooled statistic um, summarizes the effectiveness of this intervention, the experimental intervention compared with your comparator or controlled intervention. Now, um, these are the basic steps in conducting systematic review, of course. As with any type of research, you start with your research question. And here you frame your review question, followed by identifying relevant work. Um, and then you assess the quality of included studies. And then you summarize your evidence, you interpret your findings. Uh, sorry, and then you interpret your findings. All right, so just five basic steps. But you know, in, the, in, in real life, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. So you frame your review questions, you identify relevant work, uh, you assess the quality of included studies, you summarize your evidence, uh, and meta-analysis is one way of summarizing your evidence. It's not the only way to summarize evidence. Creating a table will do just as well right, if a meta-analysis is not warranted, and then finally you interpret your findings. So the first is for you to frame your review question. So re your review question provides the framework for your um, review of available evidence. Uh, and your review question would usually fall within the following categories. So the majority of systematic reviews are systematic reviews of interventions or treatment, but there are also systematic reviews of, uh, let's say, diagnostic tests, prognosis, uh, service delivery training, or even economics, right? But for, for, for this lecture, we'll focus on systematic reviews of clinical interventions or treatment. And uh, when you frame your systematic review of an intervention or treatment, as I've mentioned, you have to specify the population, the intervention, the comparator, the outcome, and even uh, the specific methods, the specific designs uh, that you will include in your review. Now, the second step is for you to identify relevant work. And this is actually a very tedious process. The goal here is to avoid missing any important article, even at the expense of inefficiency. So this is where the difference between a systematic review and a rapid review comes in, right? In a systematic review, um, you want to include all important articles, all important relevant articles, even if the process is inefficient. In a rapid review, you're kind of following the steps in the systematic review process, but you're trying to cut corners in a way because you want to release the results of your review. Kaya nga siya na rapid, rapid review as fast as possible, right? So you want to balance in a way rigor and efficiency. So when you're doing that, then you're essentially doing a rapid review. So uh, let's say the Department of Health, I do a lot of systematic reviews for the Department of Health before I left for for Brown. So when they asked me to carry out a systematic review and a meta-analysis for a given clinical question, that's actually one of the first things that I asked from them. Um, do you want a regular or traditional or classical literature, uh, sorry, a systematic review, or do you want a rapid review? Because, you know, that choice will dictate, let's say, the time frame and even the budget. Now, um, these are just some of the sources of relevant work. So usually, this is the first thing that you need to do. You search your bibliographic databases. Uh, we have a lot. An example of this would be Medline uh, or PubMed. And then um, there's, uh, there's um, Ovid, I think. Uh, but the, the key thing when you're searching bibliographic databases is you search several. So it's really not a systematic review if it's just one database that's, that, that's you're searching. So if you're carrying out a systematic review for your, for your research and then submitting it for, let's say, a research contest at the end of the year, uh, this is actually one of the first things that I look for. How many databases did you search, right? Kasi kung PubMed lang siya, if it's just Medline, then that's a big big minus on your part. Okay, so we search uh, several bibliographic databases. So um, the Department of Health, I think, requires 
uh, Medline or PubMed and there's Embase, but the problem with Embase is it's a paid um, bibliographic database. So you, you actually have to have a subs subscription in order for you to search that. Uh, others would search, let's say Scopus, for example, PsycInfo, et cetera, okay? But you know, the, the key thing here is that you're, sever you're searching several bibliographic databases. So uh, this actually makes um, the process of identifying relevant work quite difficult and tedious. Um, of course, you can read uh, recent uh, reviews, recent um, systematic reviews in your textbooks, but again, your textbooks might actually, actually be quite old. Uh, and then you can seek the advice of experts in the content area. Maybe they can refer you to some of the seminal work uh, related to your question of interest. You can actually consider articles that are cited in articles already found by other approaches that say, um, if this seminal article includes a bibliography, I usually check what's included in the bibliography. They usually call this the historical method. And then um, this is very important. Uh, you consult databases of clinical trials. So what I usually do is um, search Medline, Embase, uh, PsycInfo, and some other bibliographic databases, and then search a separate data, database of clinical trials. So ito mga databases na ito just includes a clinical trials. And a good start would be your Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Clinical Trials. And then um, actually for purposes of detecting publication bias, you can even uh, review registries of clinical trials. So if you're familiar with how clinical trials are done, uh, it's usually good practice to register trials. So there's like clinical trials that gov that's uh, maintained by the US NIH, right? So you can look into that just to be aware of what trials are currently being done or completed trials already of your review question of interest. Now, the third step is for you to assess the quality of ed evidence. And this is where methodologic expertise comes in. So if you're planning on carrying out a systematic review, if, and if you're not uh, very confident with methodologic assessment uh, of, of the included studies, then it's a good idea to include, let's say, an epidemiologist, a clinical epidemiologist, a biostatistician, or somebody who's uh, confident, right, in, in assessing the quality or the methodologic rigor of your studies. So we usually call this risk of bias assessment or ROB assessment. It's an important step when you're conducting a systematic review with or without a meta-analysis. It's important for two reasons. The first is that your ROB assessment is actually an overall assessment of the validity of your review findings. So again, we're encountering this word validity. Validity just refers to how close your findings are to the truth, right? So your ROB assessment will actually give you an idea whether your findings are valid or not. And then the second would be uh, findings from your ROB assessment actually serve as input when you're generating what we call an evidence profile and a, a summary of findings table, right? I'll show an example later. So your evidence profile and summary of findings table. And these two tables here, your evidence profile table and your summary of findings table are actually very important when you're conducting, a, uh, when, when you're um, developing a clinical practice guideline, right? So the, the, the flow chart, the flow really is that you carry out a systematic review, right? You carry out a meta-analysis and then um, you summarize your findings using your evidence profile table and then your SOF table. And then these two tables here are usually required when the results of such a systematic review are used to make policy or clinical recommendations, or in short, when you're uh, developing clinical practice guidelines. Now, there are several tools available to assess for risk of bias. Um, there's Robbins one, uh, I think this one is, uh, Robin stands for risk of bias for non-interventional studies. So there are two versions. There's, there's a JDAD score. This is actually a simpler, actually the simplest of the tools. But my favorite, my research team uses the, the, the risk of bias version two tool. It's a very a complicated tool to use, but so far we haven't really received any questions from our reviewers, right? Or, or, or from, from the Department of Health uh, when it comes to our risk of bias because this tool is actually quite comprehensive. Okay, so this is uh, what I mentioned about your evidence profile. So you see here, so this is actually your forest plot, 
right? If you're doing a Cochrane type a systematic review, and if you're doing it in Revman, a reference manager, that's that's a software or a, yeah, it's a software or a program that's uh, used to conduct uh, systematic reviews following Cochrane guidance, right? It will actually yield you this uh, tiles. These are color-coded tiles, which indicate the extent of risk of bias for each study. So these are the individual studies. The A to E here refer to the domain of bias. So let's say when you're conducting a risk of bias assessment, there are actually different domains that you assess that say there is bias due to randomization, bias due to missing outcome data, bias due to selective reporting, et cetera. Right? So for each domain of bias for each study, you get a color-coded tile. And then, and then the last one uh, will actually give you some indication of the overall risk of bias. So if it's green, you're, in, you're good. But if it's red, if it's predominantly red, then it's bad. Right? So it's a qualitative way of, of, of presenting the results of your risk of bias assessment. Okay, so this is what I mentioned. This is what I referred to as the summary of findings table. So when you're conducting again or developing a clinical practice guideline, your quality of evidence, uh, sorry, your quality of evidence rating, which is found here at the uh, last column of your SOF table is actually partly based on your risk of bias assessment. So, right, so if you want to move forward the results of your systematic review and uh, make it an input, right, in a way, in developing clinical practice guidelines, then uh, you need to carry out a well-conducted risk of bias assessment. Okay, the fourth step is for you to summarize your findings. Now, um, in here, we're assuming that it's appropriate for you to carry out the meta-analysis, or right? it's appropriate for you to pull, right, uh, uh, your, the, the numerical results from the individual studies. And the best way to summarize your findings is through the use of a forest plot. So your forest plot is a graphical presentation of results of a meta-analysis. Uh, it shows the number of studies that are included in the meta-analysis, references to publications of these component studies, um, the pattern of effect, effect sizes, whether let's say the studies favor treatment or favor placebo, or even about the consistency of the results. Another one would be, it would show you the number of studies that are statistically significant and what the large statistically precise studies show relative to the smaller studies. In some instances, even the order in which the studies uh, are published is also included in the forest plot. Okay. So how exactly do you read a forest plot? I know you're, you all know how to read a forest plot, but let's just go into a bit of a review. So you would usually start with a very clean slate. Okay, so you, you have here on the x-axis, the scale for the statistic that you're displaying. So in this case, it can be an odds ratio. It can be a relative risk. It can be a risk, uh, sorry, it can, be a, it can be a risk ratio. It can be a rate ratio. It can be a risk difference, right? Uh, I'm not actually very fond of odds ratios being included in the x-axis of a forest plot simply because you're conducting an RCT already. So the best measure of effect to present would be a relative risk or a risk difference. Okay, so that's really my number one aversion with the use of odds ratios um, in the x-axis of a forest plot, especially if all of the included studies are randomized controlled trials. Again, for a randomized controlled trial, the best um, measure of effect to use would be a relative risk. It can either be a risk ratio, a rate ratio, or a risk difference, or even a rate difference, not an odds ratio. The issue is that um, when your outcome is common, right? So if your outcome of interest is relatively common, and we usually peg this at around greater than or equal to 10% as the prevalence or incidence, for example, of your outcome of interest, your odds ratio overestimates the relative risk. So that's the problem with odds ratios. Okay, so that's why, you know, I really don't like odds ratios a lot. That's the first problem. The second problem is that, and I won't explain this uh, further, there's a thing called non-collapsibility of your odds ratios, which makes subgroup analysis a bit difficult and sometimes erroneous. 
right? So, uh, so, so the use of odds ratios in RCTs is really not that warranted. So if I were you, if you're conducting an RCT or carrying out a systematic reviews, uh, systematic review, including several RCTs, then just present your statistic as either your RR or risk difference, okay? But anyway, your x-axis will include the scale for the statistic that you're displaying, and then you will you will usually have a line of null effects. So if we're talking about a risk ratio here, if you recall my previous lecture, the 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 what you call this, then the value of no effect is one, right? So it's called the line of no effect. Okay. Just uh, just be aware of that. Okay. Now in here we're now plotting the results of the individual studies, right? So this one you're plotting um, the point estimate. So this is study, let's, let's label this as study B, right? So this one is the point estimate of the relative risk from study B. And then the line here is your 95% confidence interval. So let's say study B might have um, resulted in, let's say, a point estimate of your relative risk that's equal to, let's say, 0.3 or 0.4. And then here, you will see how wide your confidence interval is, okay? So, so that's essentially how you read this. So these are the individual studies. The, the, the squares are the point estimates. And then the lines would be your confidence interval estimate, okay? Now, please take note. If the confidence interval, if the line crosses the line of null effect, then your point estimate is not significant. Please take note of that. So if you have to take it down in the note, do so, okay? If the line crosses one, then your point estimate you're finding from that particular study is not significant, okay? So given, given this, uh, what do you call this, given this, uh, forest plot, we see that findings from study B statistically significant because the confidence interval does not cross the line of no effect. But the same cannot hold true for the, the results of study B and the results of study C. Okay, so just very quickly, um, how many studies do you think are statistically significant given this forest plot? How many studies do you think can you just type it in the chat box? How many studies are statistically significant? So we have here, how many studies? There are five studies. One, two, three, four, five. How many studies are statistically significant? So we have one, two, three, four, five studies. Okay, so I think there's a confusion here. If you were to ask me, there's just one study that's statistically significant. You don't consider the diamond because the diamond is the pulled effect size, okay? So this is, we only have study one. I hope you can see my, uh, my, my uh, cursor. This is study one, study two, three, four, five. So if you look at it, only study three did not, the 95% the, the confidence interval of study three did not cross the line of uh, no effect. So it's only study three that's statistically significant. Now this one, the diamond here, this is now your pulled effect size. So when I combine together, so if I combine the data coming from the five studies, right? And then compute a pulled or combined relative uh, risk, then the center of the diamond would be the point estimate of that uh, pulled relative risk and then the width of the diamond would be the confidence interval. So you're correct in a way in saying that the combined effect or the pulled effect is statistically significant. So if this were an, if this were an exam, I would have given you partial points, right? <laughs> okay, so, but you know, I think some of, some of our participants are giving the right answer. So thank you so much for those who responded. Okay, so just remember if it's a diamond, it's a pulled effect size. So in this case, our pulled effect size is statistically significant. So that's actually the beauty of conducting a meta-analysis. So you see, there are actually four studies, right? Four studies here that are statistically that are not statistically significant, but when we pull together all the five studies, then we come up with a statistically significant uh, um, combined effect, no way. 
Okay, so um, you can expand the forest plot and add additional information. So you can have, let, let's say, uh, you know, a column for this study or subgroup. So in here, um, it's usually, so each study is usually identified by the lead author and uh, the year of publication. So there are some instances in which a particular study is labeled by the particular name or the specific name of the trial, right? But it's really not uncommon for individual studies to be labeled according to the lead author and the year of publication. And then these two columns here will show you, let's say, the number of uh, individuals allocated in the treatment group and in the control group, and then the number of events occurring in each group. So it, for, for the GAMSU 1989 studies, 131 were um, randomized or allocated to the treatment group and 137 were allocated to the control group. So out of the 131 in the treatment group, 15 developed the outcome of interest versus 22, right, in the control group. Now, um, this one, this column just illustrates the lines of the forest plot in figures. So it actually just tells you the exact risk ratio and the exact confidence interval. So uh, this is actually quite useful if, you know, if the, the, the other end of the, the line for the confidence interval is just barely touching the line of no effect. So it's actually a good idea to go back to the actual figures, because if it crosses one, then you would know that um, the, the, the point estimate is not statistically significant. So the diamond here, as I've mentioned, this is the, the pooled or combined effect. So for this particular example, the pooled or combined relative risk is 0.77, and you have here the confidence interval estimate. Okay. So here, let's say our confidence interval. So again, how do you interpret your confidence interval? Uh, if you're using a frequentist, sorry, if you're using a Bayesian way of uh, what to call interpreting your confidence interval, you say that we are 95% sure that the true combined or pooled relative risk is between 0.67 to 0.89. So I repeat that. So we're 95% sure or confident that the pooled or combined relative risk is between 0.67 2.89. Of course, there is a different interpretation if you're using the frequentist philosophy. Now, you can also use information from the confidence interval to judge, again, whether the pooled effect size is significant or not. So we, he, we see here that the confidence interval does not include one or it does not cross one. So you can say that the 0.77 here is statistically significant. Okay. Now, um, in here, you also have uh, what you call this some information that's usually appended at, uh, at the, the lower end of your forest plot. Uh, you'll, you'll eventually, you'll, you'll usually see this, some measures of heterogeneity. Okay, so heterogeneity essentially answers the question, do my, sorry, do the individual studies come from the same population? Or, or, or uh, what you call, are we studying the same population? Let's say I have five, let's say I have several studies here, right? Uh, I didn't count how many studies we have here, but when we're talking about heterogeneity, we're essentially asking the question, uh, do this, were these studies conducted in the same underlying population, right? So, so if you say that the studies are homogenous, you say that even if several studies were conducted, conducted, essentially, these studies were conducted on essentially the same population, right? So in here, um, if the, sorry, look at the, the p-value of the chi-square for your test of heterogeneity. I know it's statistics, but look at the p-value, right? If it's your p-value is less than or equal to your given level of significance, let's say if it's less than or equal to 0.05 or 5%, then there is evidence of heterogeneity. In short, there's evidence that, you know, the, the populations studied in these individual trials, for example, come from different underlying populations. Okay, so again, another way for you is to look at the I squared statistics. So the higher the I squared, the more heterogeneous the studies are, the more different uh, the underlying populations of the individual studies are. 
Okay, so if you have an I squared that's equal to zero, it's, it's a statistical way of saying that the populations included in the different studies are essentially similar or are essentially homogeneous. Okay. Okay, so given that, let's try to read a forest plot. Okay, uh, can we have the first uh, poll question? So you have here three studies. Uh, the first poll question is asking you, sorry. Can we launch for the first uh, poll question yet? Okay, so given this, how many, so, sorry, what is the pooled relative risk obtained from the meta-analysis? Pooled relative risk that's obtained from the meta-analysis. So what should you look for? I hope you're able to see the, what they call this, the forest plot. It's a very simple forest plot. It's just for training purposes. Okay, so we have 18 participants, 19 participants out of the 101 responding. Come on, you can do better than that. Um, PAO. <laughs> okay, so we have a 23% response rate, 25. Okay, uh, just five more, five more seconds. Okay, so we can end the poll. Uh, Twenty-eight of you, twenty-eight percent of you answered, and uh, the majority answered uh, D, which is like 0.87, And of course, you're, you're you're correct. So you look at the diamond, right? The diamond, this one. So this is your pooled relative risk. So so correct. Okay, the next question. So we'll have question number two. So is the pooled relative risk statistically significant? Is the pooled relative risk statistically significant? What should you look for? Should it cross or should it not cross? So that's essentially the question here, right? So better response rate this time, 37% um, of the participants uh, are answering. Let's give it around 15 seconds more. Is the pooled relative risk, so this 0.87, is it statistically significant? Five more seconds. Okay, I'll end the poll and the correct answer, like medyo hate, right? 45% um, said uh, yes, it's statistically uh, significant. And then 52% um, said no. The correct answer is it's not statistically significant because your diamond crosses the line of no effect. Again, so please take note of that. If, uh, what they call this, if the line or the diamond crosses the line of no effect, then the point estimate is not significant. Another way to look to, to check for that is you try to ask where is one, given this confidence interval, given this 95% confidence interval, where can I find my uh, value of no effect? The value of no effect is one, right? So where is one? Is it inside or outside this confidence interval? Because if it's inside the confidence interval, then we say that the the point estimate is not significant, okay? Because you will usually see this instead of the author is presenting p-values for the, what they call this, for the, for the pooled effect, they will just show you your, uh, what they call this, they will just show you your confidence interval estimates. Okay, the last is for you now to interpret your findings. And in here, you interpret your findings in the context of publication bias, very important, publication bias and other biases, and then um, heterogeneity for treatment effects. So I'll discuss the two very briefly. So uh, publication bias occurs when the publication of studies depend on the nature and direction of results 
such that your published studies may be systematically different from those of unpublished studies. So this is actually the, the most important bias that you have to be aware of when you're reading a systematic review and meta-analysis, publication bias, right? It's highly probable, it's highly possible that what you're able to include in your systematic review um, were studies that were highly significant or highly statistically significant. Because what usually happens is that trialists, for example, or researchers or investigators would not want to publish, let's say, a trial that has negative findings or a trial that's, that has uh, non-significant findings. So, so what's really out there in the literature would be you know, uh, studies or articles that are generally positive, for example, or highly statistically significant. So when that happens, then you have uh, publication bias. Now, heterogeneity of treatment effect is not actually a threat to the validity of your study, but it's actually very important to investigate it nonetheless. So heterogeneity of treatment effect just refers to differences in the effect of treatment that's usually quantified by your relative risk or risk difference across studies, right? So let's say, if I only include trials that include, sorry, if I, if I only analyze trials that, I, that included only males, right? Uh, what would be the pooled relative risk? If I, if I only included in my analysis trials that only included females, what would be the result or what would be the combined relative risk? If the two are very different, then you say that there's heterogeneity of treatment effect. So heterogeneity of treatment effect is usually investigated using subgroup analysis. Now, one way for us to um, determine for the presence of publication bias through the use of a funnel plot. So your funnel plot, just by the x-axis of your funnel plot is the estimate of your effect size. It can be a mean difference, it can be your risk ratio, it can be your, um, you know, your relative risk, your risk ratio, your rate ratio, or any other effect, uh, sorry, any other uh, measure of effect that you're interested in. And then the y-axis will usually uh, include some measure of precision. So you can include in your y-axis, let's say the sample size of the individual studies or the inverse of the standard error of uh, the point estimates, okay? So again, any measure of precision. Now, um, if you have, so if you're plotting now your studies in a, in a funnel plot, so you have here your effect size estimate and some measure of precision, right? If you have this really nice funnel here, then you see that there's, there's really no evidence of publication bias. So here, the results of your smaller studies, kasi nga diba, if you have smaller studies, you have less precision or have smaller sample size. So the results now of your smaller studies are more widely spread around the average right, compared to results of larger studies. So this is your average, right? So it actually looks like a funnel plot. Sorry, it, it actually looks like an inver inverted funnel, right? So if, if you see this shape here, then that's actually evidence that there is no publication bias, okay? If there is um, a symmetry, so we call this funnel plot symmetry, then there is evidence of publication bias. Okay, so yeah, this is, this is a very glaring example of the possibility that publication bias existed in the study. Now, um, your funnel plot will only be useful if your systematic review and meta-analysis included at least 10 studies, because you, know, you need at least 10 to appreciate the shape of the funnel. So if it's less than that, then your funnel plot might actually not be the best option to detect publication bias. And there are statistical tests, right, uh, for, for, uh, for, for funnel plot asymmetry or for detecting publication bias that will not cover, cover that in this lecture. Okay, now um, heterogeneity of treatment effect, as I've mentioned a while ago, refers to whether, uh, what they call this, you would obtain different pooled estimates in subgroups of your, of your uh, population. So in this example, we have here meta-analysis of studies addressing the effect of vitamin D on non-vertebral fractures. So what the authors did was to carry out what we call a subgroup analysis, right? So they only, they, they, they group together trials in which the dose of vitamin D is 400 IU per day. And then they created another group for studies in which the dose of vitamin D is 700 to 800 IU per day. And they computed um, 
hold relative risk for these subgroups, okay? So that's, that's actually how you detect heterogeneity of treatment effect. The 1.03 here and the 0.75, these are your estimates of treatment effect. And if you look at it, they are heterogeneous. They're quite different, right? Um, is this a problem in your study? No, it's, definite, it's definitely not. This is actually a very interesting finding because in here you can say that maybe vitamin D will only be beneficial in doses 700 to 800 IU per day, but not in doses as low as 400 IU per day, right? So again, if there's heterogeneity of treatment effect, it's not a threat to validity. It's actually a very interesting finding. It's actually a very important finding because if you're given this, then you know what specific dose will actually work. Okay, in the context of individual studies, heterogeneity of treatment effect as shown here is also uh, termed effect measure modification or effect, effect modification. And this is a very interesting thing that you need to explore. Okay, so let me now move on to critically appraising a systematic review. So I spent quite some time providing some theory, but don't worry, the next uh, part is actually quite short. Uh, we only have few a guide questions when we're appraising the quality of a systematic review and meta-analysis. I know uh, Dr. Santa Maria is raising her hand. Uh, I'll answer your question, doctor, at the end of the lecture if you, you'll allow me. So we have, again, the first set of questions are primary validity guides. So the first question is that, did the review address a focused clinical question? So again, that's very important. And then were the criteria for searching and selecting articles for inclusion and exclusion explicit and credible, right? So you'll see, uh, you have, you know, when you're conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis, you have to be very detailed in describing how you included and excluded certain articles to include in your SR and your MA. Your secondary validity guides would, would include the following was the validity of your, of your included studies appraised. So we're talking about risk of bias. That's why I talked quite lengthily about a risk of bias a while ago. And then the, the third would be, what, what are the overall results of the review? And then the fourth set would be, can the results help me in caring for my patients? Patients, again, going back to your patient, we have specific questions here. Are the study patients similar to my own? Are the results of the review relevant to my patient? Okay, so let's start with the first question. Did the review address a focus clinical problems? Like, sorry, did the review address a focus clinical problems? So, lang dapat. Okay, so systematic reviews summarize publications related to a similar topic, or it should, should only be addressing, uh, you know, a, a very specific questions, right? However, this can't be helped since several studies are combined. Sometimes the purpose of the review is unclear or is very broad. So this is where your judgment comes in, right? So to determine the objective of your review, the clinical problem must be focused, right? So there should be a clear description of the patient, the exposure or the intervention, the comparator, and even the outcome of interest. So this is an example that I've included in this lecture. It's a Cochrane review. Uh, the title of the review is an antibiotics versus placebo for acute bacterial con conjunctivitis. This is quite old. I think it's in 2009, right? But I think it's a good idea. So you see here, I directly lifted this from the article. It says here that this review aimed to analyze evidence from double mask, randomized placebo controlled trials. So even the type of studies I specified in the question, sorry, right? To ascertain if antibiotic therapy, topical or systemic, confers any benefit in the management of acute bacterial con conjunctivitis. And the, the, the article actually goes as far as specifying the type of studies, the type of participants, the type of intervention, and enumerated all the outcome measures. So if you see this, then the answer to the question is a good yes. It's a confident yes, right? For me, I think this review focuses on a very specific clinical question. Okay, now the second uh, validity guide is that um, where the criteria for, for uh, selecting right, your articles, for searching and selecting for your articles, and for including and excluding them explicit and credible. So here, systematic search 
an appraisal of the literature should be done in order to ensure that no relevant articles were missed. Again, the importance of a really well-conducted literature search. It's not just an ordinary literature search. It has, it has to be very systematic. Uh, so we, we, we usually even include the, the exact syntax that we use, the, the exact search terms that we use, right, when we're submitting articles for publication. So it has to be a very systematic, rigorous search. Uh, even the appraisal of the literature has to be rigorous, rigorous in order to ensure that no relevant articles were missed. So there are two things that you need to check for here. The first is that the paper or the article should describe the method of searching, right? Uh, how did the authors carry out the search? So again, for those of you planning on conducting a systematic review for your research project, you look at you know, examples of how they describe uh, their, their literature search. Because you know, uh, describing your method of of searching assures your readers that findings from your study were based on a wide range of sources and represents the most current and most complete information about your problem. So it's an assurance to the reader that, okay, you were thorough, you were comprehensive in your literature search. So that's the first thing that you have to check, the method of searching, right? So this is a, this is a generic thing that I usually look for. Uh, an electronic search of published articles in Med9 using whatever terms from 1966 to 2018 was published, or sorry, was conducted. Now, that's the again, as I mentioned, first is look how they carry, carried out the search. The second is how did the authors screen the articles? Okay, how did they decide which article to include or to exclude from the review? Okay, it has to be very explicit as well. Right, because uh, you know this description will assure your readers that articles used in the review were objectively chosen, right, and not because they agree with the author's prior knowledge or prior beliefs or prior opinions. Okay, so this is where the objectivity of the review comes in. Okay, so even the criteria for inclusion and exclusion should be specified. Uh, we do this, we do this. It's a standard in our systematic reviews. We, we try to be very explicit with our inclusion and exclusion criteria. That's one way of doing it. Um, a complementary way of doing it is we allow for what we call, um, what we call this, um, like basing it on the opinion or the assessment of at least two reviewers. And the reviewers must agree must both agree on the decision. If not, then it's resolved by a third party, right? So this is an example of how it's done. So all retrieved abstracts were reviewed by two independent reviewers and any disagreement between the reviewers were resolved by one round of consensus. So meron pang ganon, uh, additional work followed by arbitration by a third reviewer, right? So that's one way to do it. Okay, so again, going back to the conjunctivitis systematic review that I presented a while ago. So you see here a very detailed description of electronic searches. This is actually, this is actually what's good with Cochrane reviews. They uh, describe their procedure for uh, electronic searches. Uh, they also describe uh, their procedure when they're searching for other resources and for trials. So they can be as detailed as that, okay? Okay, the third question, was the validity of your included studies appraised and was the appraisal reprodu reproducible? So again, was risk of bias assessment done? And if it's done, do you think you can, uh, you know, uh, you, do you think you can reproduce or you can carry out the appraisal that they did? So a standard appraisal of each article must be done as uh, we've established a while ago because even if all included studies are RCTs, there may be some differences in the way the, start, the, the RCTs were conducted that might affect the results of your study. So not all RCTs are created equal. That's why you have to appraise each RCT, each article that's, that, that describes a particular RCT, okay? Please take note of this. A peer review of your article prior to publication is usually not a reliable method for appraisal. So you don't just rely on the fact that it's published in a reputable journal. You have to carry out the appraisal yourself because peer review, peer review and appraisal or risk of bias assessment are actually two very different things.
Okay, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, no agreed standards to evaluate validity. There are several tools to do this. You have Robbins 1, Robbins 2, JDAD, um, and then your risk of bias version 2 tool. Whatever tool you use, okay, you just have to be very explicit about it. And you have to pre-specify it even in your review protocol, right? What tool will I use? Okay, and then even how you carry out the assessment. See, usually I'm standard data is that, again, two independent reviewers who appraise the quality of the studies. Okay, so again, going back to the conjunctivitis example, so this is how they assess methodologic quality. Uh, they use an older version, the version one of the race of bias tool, right? So, but you know, if you're doing this study now, then the version two would be the most appropriate. And then what are the overall results of the review? So here, you not only look at the diamond, okay? You look for clinically relevant results. The beauty with systematic reviews is that you would have forest plots for each outcome of interest, right? Actually, uh, you know, in a, in a well-conducted systematic review, you can have several forest plots with each forest plot, uh, you know, um, referring to a particular comparison or with each forest plot, just looking to a particular outcome, right? So don't be overwhelmed, look for clinically relevant results. And I think this is the, the question that I posed two weeks ago, right? What would be your patient important outcomes? So I think the, the first thing that you need to do is look into difference in mortality, difference in quality of life, since your ophthalmologist may be even the incidence of blindness, for example, or some measure of visual function, et cetera, right? So again, um, look into patient important outcomes or clinically relevant results. Look for results of subgroup analysis, right? Kasi baka mamaya, there's heterogeneity of treatment effect, there's effect measure modification, and actually the results of this subgroup analysis are very useful in determining who to target the intervention with, right? Because it, it, it enables you to identify individuals or population group, subgroups who will benefit most from, from the given intervention. So again, you check for differences in treatment effect. It can either be a relative risk, a risk difference, an odds ratio according to categories of some variable. It can be dose. It can be even um, some demographic characteristic like age, for example, or sex, or even the severity of illness. Okay, now in the results of your meta-analysis, check for your confidence interval not only to look into the precision of your estimate, but also to determine whether your findings are statistically significant, okay? So this is from the antibiotics example. If you look at it, the pulled um, effect estimate is 1.24, and the outcome here is clinical remission. So there's a 24 higher, 24, 24 a higher probability, right, of um, clinical remission in the antibiotics group compared to the placebo group. And this would be your confidence interval, uh, 1.05. Yeah, malapit sa one. So I'd be careful interpreting this up until 1.45. And then the last two are the study patients similar to my own. Um, in a systematic review, please take note of this. Your, the characteristics of patients included in the review uh, you know, would actually vary. So, there, so the applicability, therefore, of your systematic review will also be wide. Kasi nga, di ba, the individual studies uh, actually enroll different types of patients. If you pull all of them together, then the more varied the pool population becomes. So what happens now is that the applicability becomes wider. So again, a lot of your judgment will come in to answer this question, right? Now, when differences in characteristics of patients included uh, in the systematic review may influence the result, then you look for subgroup analysis. Again, very important, subgroup analysis. And, and usually, you know, even for uh, review protocols, we, we actually look for planned subgroup analysis because at the back of the reviewer's mind, they have an idea as to the type of patients that the intervention works best, right? So you try, try to formalize that with subgroup analysis. And then the last, are the results of the review relevant to my patients? So the good thing is that if your clinical question, the clinical question of the review is focused, um, you can just check the outcome that's measured and, deci and decide whether this is relevant to your patient, right? 
However, when the outcome differs among studies, as is usually the case, okay, you look into your pooled effect sizes. That's the beauty of your meta-analysis, right? Or you look at the results of the individual studies, right? Kasi baka mamaya, tawag dito, in some particular study, in, in just one or two studies that's included in the meta-analysis, they focus on the exact same outcome that you're interested in, then you can just look into the results of those studies rather than looking at a pooled effect estimate of an outcome that you think is not relevant for your patient. So again, a lot of going back to your patient, talking to your patient, and integrating it with your clinical judgment. So these are my references. So I'll stop sharing my slide here. Um, do we have questions about this point? <coughs> Hi, I'm here. Good morning again. We have a good, thank you for the lecture, no? but Kanina, uh, I wanted to interrupt because there's a question related to the voice plot. I think for, for the residents' benefit, what the important thing is they know how to analyze the forest plot because that's very essential when they look at comparing results and then want if they want to make um, conclusions out of the studies. So the very basic question is, what does the size of the boxes signify in the forest plot? Okay, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. The size of the box has something to do with the sample size. Okay, so let me share again my, thank you so much. I think it, it was Dr. Ventura who asked that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Ventura, for, for asking that question. I totally miss it out. Okay, so let me share my slides again. Sorry. Okay, so the size of the box tells you uh, information about the size of this study. So the larger the box, the larger the sample size, right? So the larger the box, the larger the sample. So, so just by looking at the forest plot, you would know uh, which studies had really, really large sample sizes and which one didn't, you know, had, had small sample sizes. Now, uh, the thing is that when your sample size is large, your confidence interval in most instances becomes narrower. Right, so the, the larger the sample size, the more precise your estimate of treatment effect becomes. And precision of a treatment effect is quantified by the confidence interval. So it follows that when you have a large box, the line becomes narrower, or the whiskers, in a way, if you want to call it that, the whiskers become narrower. So if we have a very small sample size as shown by the second study uh, in this slide, you will see that you know the line becomes very wide. Itong arrow dito ibig sabihin hindi nakinaya nung nung x-axis mo. So nilagyan na lang nila ng arrow ibig sabihin it, ex it extends even further back, right? Super super wide, super super wide ng confidence interval, and that's expected because you see the size. You look at the size of the box; it's very small. So it usually has a very small sample size. Okay, so. Yeah, that's, that's the quick answer to that. So the box represents the size of this study. So you have a, you have a large box, you usually have a very, very uh, narrow whisker or a narrow band of your confidence interval. Um, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the other issues with regards to uh, performing these studies is um, we have to exhaust all means to be able to get all the uh, studies that were done in this particular uh, study. And I think, uh, like what you mentioned, you have to look at uh, a lot of the databases so that you make sure that you don't miss out on a study that may have been published, um, whether it's in another language, so that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's very important, uh, sorry, uh, if I may interrupt you there. You don't exclude on the basis of language of publication, right? Uh, very important, but it's usually, especially for resident and fellow written systematic reviews and meta-analysis, actually even for, for consultants, I've seen that they usually exclude on the basis of language of publication. Kasi nga, paano kung Spanish and Portuguese, stuff like that. You know, um, but the Cochrane, especially if you're following Cochrane methods, they don't um, recommend uh, excluding on the basis of language or pub of publication. So you still include that. That that was actually a dilemma of the first systematic review that I did for for um, 
for the Philippine Department of Health, we had two articles that were published in Portuguese. And these were really, really good articles based on the English abstract. So we had no choice. You had to rely on Google Translate, uh, you know, or, you know, and, and, and I think for one of the articles, we were able to, to um, communicate with the authors and the authors were kind enough to, to, you know, interpret some of the findings for us. So, yeah, so that's, that's one of the difficulties of carrying out a systematic review. Okay, yes. Um, so, so, of course, yes, like what you said, you have to include um, studies which may be um, written in other languages. And if you cannot translate them by Google Translate, you can coordinate <laughs> with, uh, you can coordinate with the, the authors. authors, right? Um, so what, what if during the course of your analysis, um, of course, you've already maybe shortlisted the, the articles that you will review. What if in the course you find out uh, other studies which may be relevant to your study? Do you still include that even if you're in the analysis phase already? Or okay, that's a bit... Add a okay, uh, that's a... Yeah, that's a bit problematic because if uh, you already have, let's say, if you if you followed your process and then you're able to, let's say, identify 20 studies to include in your systematic review, and then for some reason, you're able to find, let's say, from the internet or from Twitter, for example, that there is this study that's relevant, but was not included in your 20 studies that you're able to screen, then it actually said, it, it, it's, it's actually a clue that you were not thorough enough either with your search or you, did, you didn't really do a good job with screening your articles, right? So I, had, I, I, I have to be, you, you have to consider the possibility, bakit hindi siya nasama, okay? Uh, that's one. But, you know, if it's an honest mistake, for example, then you may want to include it but you just have to be very explicit about it. When you carry, when you draw your prisma diagram, right? You include now a box before that, you know, number of included studies, uh, you know, telling you or specifying that I included one study from this particular source. You just have to be very explicit about it. But if you do encounter that, then it's time for you to rethink your methods because if you actually did a good job at doing your search, doing your screening, et cetera, then that study, if you think that study is very important and would satisfy all of your criteria, that study should have been included in the first place. Okay. And um, you also discussed about the tools that we have to use when we analyze the paper. Um, the tools that you are going to use should be included in your design as well. You have to... And how do you decide which tool to use for a particular question at hand? Uh, uh, what do you call this? I think the first one is that um, there are actually literature uh, telling you which of the tools would be best. And of the, of the list that I gave you, uh, there's evidence showing that uh, Rob version 2 is actually the best of the different tools that I presented. But some systematic reviewers would, would use JDAD scoring, for example, because it's easier to use. It's, re it's reproducibility among different reviewers is actually easier, especially if you're assessing several studies, right? So let's say, paano kung ang ano mo, and I think this happened in one of the SRs that I did, uh, my final included list of studies amounted to 60. Right, so if there are 60 and I need at least two reviewers to assess all 60 studies, then the risk of bias, the ROB version two tool is actually uh, very tedious. And actually we use that. So it took us around three months to appraise all 60. Okay, but for, uh, for some authors, for that uh, amount of studies, they, you know, they just don't have the time. So they will use JDAD scoring, for example, because uh, it's a lot easier, it's a lot uh, reproducible among the different reviewers. So that's one consideration. And then another one is that if you're following a specific methodology, or let's say if you're doing a Cochrane type um, systematic review, then the, the default for that would be your risk of bias version two. Okay, so if you're aiming to publish in let's say your Cochrane uh, journal, then ROB is the way to go, right? I think even in some uh, journals in internal medicine, for example, they also advise that. So, so yeah, but you're correct, sir, when you said that 
even at the stage of developing your review protocol, you have to specify what specific tool you use and append them in your, include them in your appendix. If you look at the ROB version two tool, it's actually very complicated. Um, and you know, there's actually even a separate tool, whether if it's an individually randomized study or a cluster randomized study, there are a lot of signaling questions. Even the guide for that is several pages long. So yeah, you really have to think uh, really, really well if you want to use that. Maybe it's doable for just a few of the studies, but if it's, it becomes unwieldy, then you know you, you need to you need to have several trained uh, research assistants, for example, or you yourself as the, the, the investigator has to do that, has, has to carry out uh, the assessment. Yes. Um... During the, the lockdown, when there's a limitation to do face-to-face -face or clinical studies, one, of course, one of the options is to perform a systematic review or meta-analysis. But of course, it's easier said than done. It's really not that easy to <laughs> do it. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of um, effort to uh, uh, review, get, get the journals, and then appraise them, and then... So it, it's, it's really a big task. It is a very daunting task. Uh, my last question actually is, um, oh, finally, if you're able to perform one and able to publish one, you submit it to Cochrane, um, will Cochrane review the um, study that you published? And if you have a published oh. material, if you have a published material, say, because it, it's, it's very difficult to perform, right? So maybe... Sometimes you get new information, maybe you have a published one five years ago. When do you update or should you update it? Because you have the ability to update it, right? You can, if you, there are more publications on it, you can um, appraise it and then add it to your previous study. So how, what is the protocol or method in doing that? Okay. Um, when it comes to publishing in Cochrane, actually that's, Quite, you know, it's a Cochrane's a collaboration, and publishing a Cochrane review is also very difficult in a way because you have to Cochrane has to approve the review before you even carry it out, right? So it has, let's say, for example, based on um, what I know, if my memory serves me right, uh, what they call this, uh, the 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 specific review question must fall under one of the areas of Cochrane. So let's say there's a Cochrane Eye Health. For example, a Cochrane Eye and Vision, I think it's based at uh, Hopkins. Yeah, I think it's based at Hopkins. So it has to be, you know, so there's a particular Cochrane branch in a way that's uh, in charge of that particular review. So it has to be registered with them. It has to be approved in a way. So even the review, review protocol has to, be, has to be approved by, by Cochrane. That's why it's quite difficult to publish in Cochrane. But, you know, it's not, it's not to say that Cochrane is the only way to publish systematic reviews. I mean, you can submit, that's why I, I said Cochrane type, not a Cochrane systematic review, right? So you can carry out a systematic review following Cochrane methods, and then you have, you, you can have that published in other reputable journals that doesn't really diminish the quality and the utility of your systematic review. If you're keen on conducting a Cochrane review, then you have to, you know, uh, collaborate, since it's a collaboration in the first, collaborate with members of a particular um, domain or area uh, uh, in, in Cochrane, have your, your review approved by them, because they will even help you in uh, your literature search. Like they have, um, like they have already preset search strategies that can make your search more efficient. So, so that's my take on that. And then when, when it comes to updating your uh, systematic review, there's really no uh, recommended interval. But the rule of thumb here is that you, you try to determine whether you can update it in after, let's say, five years or so. But again, it depends on how fast uh, you know, the, the studies are coming out. Okay, let's say um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, it was very easy to update you know, you can update your review over, you know, several times in a year because of the exponential growth in the number of studies that are being conducted on a particular question. So again, it depends on how fast the, the evidence base is growing for that uh, question. But it's always good, uh, good, um, good practice to update it as soon as you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answers to the questions. I think you all can need a break.
Uh, yeah. so we have a three minute break. Yes. Huh? We can, if you may want to have a break for a while, three minute break, is that okay? Okay, so again, thank you to everyone for uh, watching. That was all the first part uh, of the, for the lecture for this morning. Um, again, uh, for those of you who have questions, please please feel free to write your questions in the Q and A area of this um, Zoom meeting. Uh, we will get to your questions after the end of the lecture. This may be your uh, chance to be able to ask some of the unanswered questions you might have, um, and. It's okay to ask very basic questions. Uh, tai tai lang naman, all 121 of us. So again, um, we have uh, one more lecture uh, this morning, and then uh, that should wrap up module one for this um, bootcamp. Um, Okay, so three minute break. Okay, so uh, I hope you all are back from that break. So, Amiel, if you're ready for the second part of uh, this morning's lecture on CPGs. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so hi, it's me again. So this is uh, hopefully a shorter lecture, uh, critical appraisal of a clinical practice guideline. Um, this is actually quite important, especially um, in the post-pandemic uh, setting. We're seeing a lot of clinical practice guidelines being published. The rule is that we don't accept this hook, line, and sinker. Uh, we have to be very critical whether to uh, follow a particular recommendation or not. So hopefully this this lecture will assist you in a way. Okay, so we only have one session objective at the end of the session, you should be able to critically appraise a clinical practice uh, guideline. Okay, so a, a clinical practice guideline consists of um, a set of recommendations, consists of several recommendations uh, intended to optimize patient care. So that this is actually the main reason, the main goal of a CPG is to optimize uh, patient care. So very important to remember that um, your practice recommendations, those that are included in a CPG, are informed by a systematic review of evidence, mostly by systematic reviews of evidence, actually, and an assessment of benefits and harms of your alternative healthcare options, right? So your SRs and your, your systematic reviews and meta-analysis actually um, form the backbone in a way of a really good CPGs. But on, on top of that, there should be a careful assessment of the benefits and harms of alternatives, right? Alternative healthcare interventions, alternative drugs, alternative procedures, for example. Okay, uh, I've mentioned this a while ago, the ultimate goal of a CPG is to improve the quality of healthcare and you do this by reducing inappropriate variations in practice. You want to be, you know, uh, giving exactly the same, the same kind of care. And, also, and of course, ensuring a, a more efficient use of limited resources. Now, um, yeah, sorry. Now, when, um, when you're looking for CPGs to address a particular question or a, a, a problem that you may have, uh, you know, you search for relevant CPGs that might provide answers uh, to some of your questions, right? Uh, and you only consider guidelines that use a well-recognized and accepted methodology. So again, as I've mentioned, you don't accept recommendations from CPGs hook, line, and sinker. You only use guidelines that uh, that 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 use a well-recognized and accepted methodology, because believe it or not, even in the process of of uh, developing a CPG or a clinical practice guideline, there are recommended steps. Uh, there are very important steps that should not be skipped, in a way. And you know, um, CPG or guideline developer should also be very explicit with these steps. Uh, they, they need to um, describe it really well when writing the CPG itself. Again, CPGs are very difficult to, um, to carry out, very difficult to develop. We've, I've had um, you know, quite, an, quite an experience uh, developing CPGs before I left for Brown. Uh, just thinking about it, uh, it gives me a bit of a stress because it's really, really, really difficult, especially for questions that are quite too broad. Okay. Now these are potential, uh, sorry, now very important, please take note of this, that your CPGs or guidelines are often not published in peer-reviewed journals. So this is to say that maybe PubMed or MBase might not be the best uh, resource when you're looking for CPGs, because most of the time these guidelines are not published in peer-reviewed journals, and usually they will not be indexed in Medline or, or, or MBase. Uh, these are just some of the potential sources of guidelines that you may want to consider instead. Okay, so we have the National Guideline Clearinghouse. I think this is with the US. And then this is this is actually one of my favorite sites, NISE, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Uh, nice at the United Kingdom. This one is for, for UK. Then there's uh, Turning Research into Practice. I think this is also with, with UK. And then e-guidelines, okay? Now your specialty societies will also have its own database of systematic reviews. I heard from Serena a while ago that your society has published a CPG on glaucoma. So that might be a good start and you may want to appraise that eventually, okay? So what, what I'm trying to drive at here is that if you're looking for a specific CPG, Medline or Embase might not be the best uh, places to start. It, 
it will not hurt you actually if you search for it in Medline or, or Embase. But if your search will not really yield anything, then these are actually good alternatives. Okay, so this one, uh, the National Garden Clearing House is maintained by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality of, uh, in the US. It's under the US Department of Health and Human Services, right? A really nice resource for US-based CPGs. As I've mentioned a while ago, for me personally, it's a favorite. This one is NISE, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Uh, the, the one thing that I really like with the NISE guidelines is how how very detailed the methodology description is, right? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm no longer practicing, I'm not practicing. So oftentimes I'm really not interested in these specific recommendations, right? Uh, as, a, as an epidemiologist, I usually, I'm usually more interested in how they carried out uh, specific assessments of evidence, for example, or even the CPG development process. And this is always, you know, a good resource for what I consider to be standard when it, when it comes to describing how the development process went. So uh, this is a good resource if you, you're, you're planning on embarking on developing a CPG, but don't really have a, really, a, a, good, idea, a, a good idea about how to carry it out. Uh, you look into the method section of the of the CPGs. They're actually a good resource. Okay, then there's uh, turning research into practice. Uh, this one actually combines uh, guidelines from different countries. So you see here, uh, mainly from Australia and New Zealand, Canada, UK, and U USA, uh, mainly develop, uh, developed countries. It's still a good start, right? And then of course your e-guidelines, UK. Okay, so here we go directly into the guide questions. Um, I have a separate lecture on CPG development, but we won't go into that. Uh, just remember, or yeah, just consider that developing a CPG is very difficult. So if your society came out with a CPG, for example, on several conditions, and you have to thank CPG developers because, you know, uh, if you only knew how difficult it is. And there are actually even uh, some societies in the Philippines who plan on you know, doing their own CPGs, but are constrained by the fact that it's very complicated. So congratulations actually to, to Pao for, for developing these CPGs. But again, regardless of the source of the CPG, these are the validity guides that you need to consider because you don't want to accept recommendations hook, line, and sinker. The first is that, were all important options and outcomes considered. So for a particular question, were all um, alternatives and outcomes considered? The second is that was an explicit and sensible process used to identify, select, and combine evidence. So it kind of looks like the validity guide for your systematic review and meta-analysis. Now, the secondary validity guides are, of, are as follows. Is the guideline likely to account for important recent developments? So you look into the recency or how, how uh, you know, the recency of the, of the material that's included in your CPG. Has the guideline been subjected to peer review and testing? And this is usually what's missed by most of the local CPGs, uh, the CPGs in the Philippines. The guideline developers fail to subject the guideline, uh, guideline, uh, guideline to peer review and testing. It's, it's still quite important that you carry this out. Okay, and then um, what are the recommendations? Uh, are practical, clinically important recommendations made? How strong are the recommendations? So you, you usually look into two here. What are the recommendations? And then how strong are the recommendations? And then the last set of questions are as follows. Will the recommendation help you in caring for your patient? So again, Again, is, your primary, is the primary objective of the guideline consistent with your own objective? And by objective here, we go back to that specific clinical question that you have that's motivated by your patient encounter. Again, are the recommendations applicable to your patients and your setting? So let's start with the first question. Um, were all important options and outcomes considered? Because of course, you want that in a CPG, they consider all possible alternatives, all possible interventions, for example. And also equally important is that they include all, all patient important outcomes, right? So CPG developers, 
should present most of the reasonable op options. And by options here, we talk about management strategy. If let's say the question is about treatment, then it will present all the types of drugs that are relevant for the particular case, right? So CPG developers should present most of the reasonable options seen in practice and their corresponding outcomes. So these two go hand in hand. You have your treatment strategies, your management strategies, and outcomes, right? So this has to be very explicit in uh, the, the CPG that you are appraising. And the reason why we look for this is that clinicians make better or optimal judgment calls if they know all alternative options. You know this, you know, you know, you, you are in the best position to, to, uh, to appreciate the importance of this because, you know, you know that when you're presented with all possible alternative options, then the better it is that your, uh, the better is your decision-making process will be. So clinicians make better or optimal judgment calls if they know all alternative options. Not only that, right? What are the relative harms and benefits of each option? Because that's essentially what decision-making is, right? Trying to balance in a way the harms and benefits of particular management strategies across the different options you have. Of course, you only have the, you know, the patient's best interest in mind. Now, um, when you're reading through a CPG, uh, you usually look for whether outcomes that the, the reviewers identified or the developers identified are ranked according to importance. And in here, you want that patient important outcomes or those that are clinically relevant to your patient are ranked the highest. So in ophthalmology, for example, maybe blindness would be at the top of the list. And then would, at the bottom would be some of your physiologic measurements, right? So outcomes that they identify for each option should be evaluated and ranked according to importance. Uh, as I've mentioned, patient important outcomes must be included. Uh, I, I usually wouldn't rely on a CPG that just focus on surrogate outcomes, physiologic measurements, bio, biochemical measurements. Uh, it has to be a hard outcome, right? A clinically important outcome. And an example of this would be mortality, morbidity, complications, quality of life in your discipline blindness perhaps, or, or some measure of visual function. Now, um, for this particular lecture, I, uh, included an, I, I included as an example this NISE guideline on the management of cataracts in adults. And it's, I don't know if you call this a recent guideline, but this one was published in 2017. So it's around five years, right? Um, and if we're, if we're uh, answering the first validity question for this specific guideline, right? The first question was, were all important options and outcomes considered? So you see here, actually they had a lot of uh, review questions in a way, they had a lot of clinical questions. So I just uh, included, included as an example, these review questions under lens design to point out that for this guideline, you see here the different options which they labeled the interventions. And then for these options, they included the following outcomes, a lot of outcomes of interest. And you would usually see this under the PICO inclusion criteria. Now, why do we have the PICO inclusion criteria in a CPG? It's precisely because in a CPG, we mainly rely on systematic reviews of available evidence. That's why you would usually see some table specifying the PICO inclusion criteria. And for, your, for this example, it's for lens material and design. So you look for this, where did, uh, did the CPG developers include uh, all possible options or interventions that are seen in practice? And did they, did they include you know, a range of outcomes? Uh, I don't know which of this, or uh, maybe visual acuity or yeah, the, the opacification might be a patient important outcome. I know uh, acu uh, acuity and function are patient important outcomes. The, the thing here is that, you know, at least in your outcomes, they try to prioritize which are the most important uh, for a particular patient. Okay. Now the second question is, was an explicit and sensible process used to identify, select, and combine evidence? As I've mentioned a while ago, when you're developing a CPG, you mainly rely on systematic reviews and meta-analysis, right? Uh, of available studies, okay? 
Uh, but it, you can also include, um, and again, this is where the difficulty of doing a CPG is, because if you're not able to identify a systematic review that addresses your clinical question, then you don't have a choice but to carry out a systematic review yourself. So you can, you know, you can think of it as doing several systematic reviews just for one CPG. So that actually makes developing a CPG very difficult. Right, but whatever whatever the process is, your developers must allow the readers to know how evidence was tracked, reviewed, appraised, and combined in order to enable them enable them to ascertain the validity of gathered evidence. Right, so as I've mentioned, CPG developers should specify a focus question, search the literature for available evidence critically appraise the evidence, summarize the results, um, and then integrate your findings into the CPG development process. Yes. So um, the way I see CPG development, especially de novo CPG development, is like doing several systematic reviews, one systematic review for each clinical question. So malas mo kung ang na-assign sa iyo, for example, is a clinical question in which you don't have a systematic review and meta-analysis. So what the only, the best thing for you to do now is for you to carry out a systematic review yourself. That's usually how it's done uh, in, in my experience with specialty societies, right? They try to identify clinical questions. And usually they, in, in, my, in my last experience, uh, a specialty society identified 20 clinical questions, right? And then they assigned each question to a committee, right? So, bunutan yan, right? Let's say, and this committee can, you know, and this, in my experience, um, for this specialty society, it's relatively, it's a very large specialty society with several training centers, right? So they assign each question to each training center. And that training center, that hospital formed a committee, right? For, to address that particular clinical question. Maswerte if the clinical question already has an SRMA, okay? They only have to like get the most important um, findings from the from the SRMA. But if, you, if the committee was assigned a question for which there's no SRMA, then walang choice ang hospital but to carry out a systematic review. So that's one way to do it. Now, um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is our way um, of, this is a method that, that we use. It, it's an example of a method to track, review, appraise, and combine evidence. We did this a lot for, for um, for CPGs that we developed for the Department of Health. So we start with clinical questions, and then from these clinical questions, we specified search terms, converted these search terms into strategies, and then carried out our literature search. Of course, we did what we call two-stage independent screening. What this means is that we screen according to abstract or according to table of contents or according to executive summary. And then after that, we screen according to the full text. Now, um, in our search, yeah, we, we, we were able to um, find several guidelines and consensus recommendations that are kind of similar to the, CPG, the, to the CPG that we wanted to develop, right? So uh, let's say an example would be substance use, substance use disorders, right? Uh, there are a lot of CPGs and consensus recommendations published all over the world on how to manage substance use disorders, right? Or alcohol use disorders, for example. So uh, if you already have published guidelines and consensus recommendations, don't throw them away. Uh, there's actually a method for you to abstract the recommendations, the evidence profiles, and uh, yeah, yeah, the recommendations, the evidence profiles, the quality of evidence, and even the strength of recommendation from these guidelines. And there's also a way for you to appraise them. So in, in, in our experience, if we're able to identify already existing CPGs, we found a way to, in, to integrate the recommendations from these existing CPGs into the recommendation that we're, into the CPG that we're doing, right? So that's one. Now, um, if you don't have a guideline or a recommend, say consensus recommendation that you're able to find, as I've mentioned, you carry out a systematic review. There's also a way to abstract information from your systematic reviews, 
right, to appraise her systematic reviews. Amstar is just one way to appraise a systematic review. If you recall, Rob 2 is used to appraise a trial. Amstar 2 is used to appraise a systematic review. So let's say, let's say again, for substance use disorder, on top of guidelines and consensus recommendations, you're able to find several published systematic reviews addressing substance use disorder. So there's also a way for us to abstract information from these existing systematic reviews and to appraise these existing systematic reviews. So we use AMSTAR2, uh, your clinical trials. Um, Covidence is an online platform for you to carry out your uh, systematic reviews and MAs more efficiently. And as I've mentioned a while ago, Rob version two is a way to appraise them. And then we, we also appraise the totality of evidence provided by SRs and clinical trials using what we call the grade approach. So kung ang SRMA is very difficult to carry out, right? Uh, so for systematic, for, for clinical practice guidelines, it takes a village. In your case, it takes an entire medical society to, you know, to carry out, to develop a CPG. So you can't do this on your own, right? Uh, no single individual can do this on his or her own, right? Uh, it's, it's a team effort, it's a group effort, right? Uh, it's an entire party uh, developing your CPG. But, you know, um, no matter how complicated it is, it actually helps if you're very explicit with your uh, strategies. Okay, so going back to our example, answering the question, was an explicit and sensible process used to identify, select, and combine evidence? So you see here from the NISA example that I showed a while ago, you see here a summary of the review protocol that they use to identify and select evidence for a given clinical question. And, you know, um, this usually gets included in the documentation. Uh, it's, an, it's an attachment or an appendix to your CPG. So they include here the review question. And this is just one of several review questions. Kasi nga, diba, in a CPG, you have several clinical questions, usually 20 or less, right? And then for each clinical question, you convert that into a review question. Uh, and then for each review question, you specify a specific type of evidence that you will search. Okay, so that's the good thing with the NISA guideline. They were very detailed, right? Uh, hindi lang pico up until, you know, um, whether subgroup analysis were uh, considered, whether they extracted um, information on baseline characteristics, stuff like that. Okay, now, so this one is uh, the protocol that they use to identify and select evidence for a given clinical question. Now, going, still going back to the NISA example, they also have a very explicit process to combine evidence from selected studies. Uh, you know, they, they were just uh, performing in, in, in here, they specified that, you know, if I didn't have systematic reviews and meta-analysis to address my clinical question, then, then I will carry out a separate systematic review or meta-analysis on my own. And even with that decision, they were very explicit as to um, what particular guidance to follow. So they said here that they will use the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Intervention. It's freely available. It's a good resource. They were even very explicit about how to pull the results or even what meta-analytic model to use. So here, a very explicit process to combine evidence from the studies. Okay. So those are the first two uh, validity guides. The third is, is the guideline likely to account for important recent developments? And, and, and for here, for this question, you look for two important dates, right? You look at the publication date of the most recent evidence that we considered. And of course, the date on which final recommendations were made. Because usually, magkaiba ito, right? Uh, the publication date of the most recent evidence is usually quite uh, earlier, right, than the date when the final recommendation was made. Because doing, you know, uh, coming out with the final recommendations will come in once the CPG developers have considered all the available evidence, right? 
So for the first one, ideally the evidence should be within the last two years before the guideline was published. So in, in, in your example, if it's published, let's say last year, then um, the most recent evidence should be within two years of that, okay? The most recent. So it should be hand that's uh, the latest evidence that you have should be within two years of that. And then of course, the, the date on which the final recommendations were made. Okay. Uh, in some instances, guideline developers also identify what we call studies in progress or, uh, you know, studies in progress or new information that could change the CPG. So you will actually encounter CPGs in which they label it as temporary or provisional. And in some instances, even the expiry date um, is specified. So let's say you will see this, especially in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic setting, when the developers are considering, uh, you know, studies that are still being carried out, but these studies are likely to affect the recommendations, they will say that, okay, this CPG will only be valid or relevant up until this particular date. And this is also the reason why they have what we call their living clinical practice guidelines. So the clinical practice guidelines are updated as uh, available evidence or new, new evidence uh, becomes uh, available in a way. Okay. So going back to the example, is the guideline likely to account for important recent developments? Uh, again, focusing on lens design. So you see here uh, for this review question, the most recent article was published in 2015 and then the guideline was published in 2017. So yeah, the answer to this question is, uh, is a confident yes. Okay, uh, the second question here is that has the guideline been subjected to peer review and testing? And this is very important, okay? So once you have developed your CPG, you have to, um, there's what we call an external review, right? So hindi lang siya within the CPG development team. It's usually not even within your, your society, right? You try to, to let others review your guidelines. Maybe you let somebody from the Department of Health review it, or maybe some from the allied professions review it, or you know, some, some of the professionals, health professionals who are likely to inter, interact with their patients. You may want them to, um, to review your guideline or to test your guideline. So your CPG should, should be subjected to scrutiny by external reviewers. There's actually a, a recommendation as to the composition of the external reviewers, but there's usually a patient representative uh, uh, among the external reviewers. Uh, in some instances, you try to test your uh, CPG in actual, in, in actual clinical practice setting and um, try to quantify its acceptability. Okay, so, um, we usually carry out consensus building in a way whether a particular recommendation is likely to be relevant in a particular setting. So there are actually standard procedures for this, but the bottom line is you subject your guideline to peer review and testing. Okay, so peer review and pre-testing addresses differences in the interpretation of your evidence as well as values and preferences. Now, um, in the NISE guideline that, guideline that I mentioned, um, even NISE will actually show or will actu actually describe how they develop their guideline. It's actually a very tedious process. But if you look into their website, you will see here that, you know, a draft guideline is always sent for consultation. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the stage in which, you know, um, you try to publicize that a guideline has already been published and then you, you invite uh, comments, for example, for that particular guideline. And then of course, you revise your guidelines based on comments that you receive from consultations or from pre-testing. Okay, and then finally, what are the recommendations? So to be useful, a CPG should give practical and ambiguous. So essentially your CPG should, should address whatever clinical question you have. So it should be a practical and ambiguous advice that addresses a, a given clinical situation. Please take note of that. Recommendations should be simple, specific, and comprehensive enough to allow the reader a chance to assess the benefits and cost of a particular recommendation, right? Um, and you know, in your appraisal form, when you're doing a formal appraisal of a CPG, you actually need to list down the clinical question and then the recommendation for each clinical question. 
So going to our example, you see here, right? For our example on lens design and material, the recommendation section is uh, presented as follows, right? So makikita mo, for recommendation, walang recommendation. And this is perfectly acceptable. There are, you know, at the end of CPG development, when you're able to consider all available evidence, et cetera, you know, just so happens that you don't have the answer to that uh, particular clinical question, so wala kang magagawa. So instead of recommending something that's not beneficial or may, may even be potentially harmful to, to your patient, you know, just leave it at that. There is no recommendation. This is common and acceptable. It's perfectly acceptable in CPG development when, number one, not enough high quality, high quality evidence exists for or against a recommendation, or number two, evidence are equivocal. It means they are in agreement, they are in disagreement with one another. So instead of committing, just say, you know, there's really no recommendation for it. Or you may want to revisit it perhaps when you update your CPG. So don't be surprised if you if you if you see this in your CPGs in the CPGs that you're appraising. Makikita nyo to madalas like there is no recommendation or like the evidence is equivocal. So dito na papasok clinical judgment po na papasok niya. Okay. Now let's look at the recommendation statement for another question. So you see here the review question was what is the optimal strategy to facilitate simultaneous distance and near vision following cataract surgery. So if you look at it, uh, very direct to the point, wala nang paligoy-ligoy pa. Do not offer, right? Do not offer or offer. Ganun lang siya. Wala, na, wala, nang, wala nang mga ano, pasakalya pa. It, it has to be very uh, straight to the point. Now, the way they phrased uh, the recommendations actually gives you some idea about the strength of recommendations. Because, you know, um, it's a different thing. You have a recommendation, but for each recommendation, you have to determine the strength of recommendation. And what's good with NISE is that for it, the way they, they, uh, they phrase or the way they write the recommendation will already give you some idea as to the strength of recommendation. And please take note that the strength of recommendation is informed by several things. Number one of which would be the quality of studies, which provide evidence for the recommendation. Kasi ang flow chart nito, ang flow, ang flow nito, you have your studies, your studies will yield evidence, and then different lines of evidence will inform recommendations. So ano yung quality of the studies that provided evidence for these recommendations? Right? Actually, that's the most important determinant of the strength of recommendation. Of course, there has to be a balance between desirable and undesirable outcomes. Kaya nga, ang strength of recommendation is informed by consensus building, right? Uh, there's really not a very objective way to determine how strong your recommendations are. It's usually a panel that decides whether it's strong recommendation or not. Kasi you have to, you know, a lot of sub subjective judgment goes into it. Uh, you know, balancing desirable and undesirable outcomes, um, relative value that's placed upon different outcomes. Let's say, you know, um, is visual loss that important compared to other visual outcomes, for example, right? So yeah, a lot of uh, subjective judgment, value judgment that, do, that goes into it. But regardless of how recommendations or regardless of how the strength of recommendations are assigned, you need to check the methods, right? How did they grade the recommendations? And the most common approach of grading recommendations is, you know, the grade approach. It's a very, very complicated um, a method to, to what they call this, put some strength of recommendation for a particular recommendation. But, you know, this is the, the flow chart for it. Uh, it's the, in the bibliography, you, you have there a, a, good, um, a good introduction into the grade approach, but you know, we use the grade approach not only for SR, SRs and MAs, but also for uh, CPGs. Okay. So going back, uh, as I have mentioned a while ago, the way they phrase the recommendations uh, give us some idea as to the strength of the recommendation. Kasi makikita mo dito, if they just use the word offer or, or do not offer, then they're using a strong recommendation. So dito, yung do not offer or offer, these are strong recommendations. Kapag may must or may must not 
sabi nila, there is a legal duty to apply the recommendations. You see, even the way you phrase the recommendation uh, will actually tell you whether that recommendation is very, very important or not. So if you say, you know, you must offer intraocular lenses or you must not offer whatever, then it says here there is a legal duty to apply that recommendation. But in here, it, they did not go as far as saying that, you know, it's your legal obligation to do this. It's just a strong recommendation. Sabi nga nila dito, yan, if, if an intervention could be used, they will use the, the term consider. So for, for guideline developers, be very careful with the language that you use when you're phrasing your recommendations, right? Okay, and then again, going back, applications is the primary objective of your guideline consistent with your objective. And in here, the objective, the second objective that I'm talking about here is that um, the objective that's informed by your patient encounter, because still, this is an EBM, EBP process, right? So you have to answer this question. Uh, relevant ba yung guideline na binabasa mo dun sa iyong uh, question of interest, right? So the purpose, or at least one of the purposes of the guideline should be in line with your objective, right? To assist you in your decision making, of course, there should be some congruence or alignment in a way in order for the CPG to be useful, right? And of course, to evaluate the standard of care that you will give to your patient. And then the last question I think is, are the recommendations applica applicable now to your patient? So it there's a you know the first question about applicability asks whether the CPG is relevant to your question. The second is that your recommendations from the CPG is applicable to your patients. So again, you must determine if the kind if the kind of patients that you have are similar to the patients targeted by the guideline. That's why it's also very important for guideline developers to be very specific. Uh, with respect to the type of patients targeted by whatever guideline they're developing. Because it answers questions of applicability later on. Okay. Now, a CPG may not apply if your patient comes from a population with a different risk of the disease. Let's say if a particular guideline is uh, targeting, let's say, just diabetic patients, then, you know, and then your question more, or patient more is, uh, you know, a, a, a totally health, otherwise healthy patient, then there might be some differences in applicability, right? Or if the diagnostic and therapeutic options recommended by the guideline are not applicable in your setting. Okay, so I, as I promised, it's a relatively short uh, lecture. There's really not much to talk about when, uh, when we discuss the appraisal of CPGs. Uh, the bottom line here is that you just have to be very critical, right? Hindi porke uh, CPG siya, eh, tatanggapin mo na siya ng buong buo. I remember in uh, when I was a medical student, we were always advised this because we tended to consider CPGs as, as the Bible, right? I think this, this was in internal medicine. But we were always advised by our professors, right, that these are recommendations. There's, these, are, these are guidelines. So it's still... You know, it's still a lot of thinking on your own to whether adopt this or not. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to, like, put the patient's best interest in mind. So this ends my lecture. Thank you, uh, Amira. Yes, again, again, very comprehensive lecture on, for this one, the clinical practice guidelines. Before we move to the question and answer portion, let me remind everyone to fill out the feedback forms posted in the, in the chat box. This will serve as your attendance for this session. For those with questions, you may still post them in the Q&A part of the link uh, for those uh, using the Zoom platform. So, um, I mean, helping the specialty societies to come out with CPGs, with more CPGs. So as uh, far as I'm concerned now, the PAO is actually in the planning stages for three more CPGs from the different subspecialty societies. So we'll be coming up with more in the next uh, one or two years. But the one that you presented, the one cater, I was fortunate to be that we we 
With the help of Dr. and Dr. Dance and the leadership of Dr. Carlos Naval, PAO came out with the CPG on cataract. And uh, one thing that uh, we did there is there were different stakeholders from a lot of um, of the not just ophthalmologists, but also some others who may be affected by the CPGs on cataract. So I think it's uh, worth worthy to mention that um, when we look at the evidences, because what we did was we had a lot of pre-reading done. A lot of materials were prepared to us, for us by Dr. and Dr. Dance. We had a lot of pre-reading done and we all came down one weekend to sit and uh, read and answer the questions and look at the evidences and materials available for us. So not just ophthalmologists look at it. We had different people from different parts of our society to be able to um, appraise the evidence available. And then, of course, because the CPGs will affect not just eye doctors, but also the patients who will be um, what the CPG will be for. So uh, when we make one or we organize one, what, what uh, how, how broad should the um, composite composition of the people who will look at the evidences should be and uh, how how extensive should our our researches should be when we uh, look uh, when we try to develop a CPG. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Kovar, for pointing that out. And that's actually very important. Um, if my memory serves me right, when you're in the when you're in the pre-CPG development stage, there are actually two committees that you need to set up. Two, two, two groups that you, that you need to set up. You have your guideline development group, and then you have your stakeholders group, right? The guideline development group would usually consist of um, individuals who will be directly in charge of um, you know, searching for the evidence, reviewing the evidence, integrating the evidence, and then developing the recommendations. So this would usually consist of ophthalmologists. These are usually the scientists, the ophthalmologists usually have, um, it's, it's very important to have an epidemiologist and a biostatistician in your group. The more the better, because you know, this, is, this is the stage of looking and integrating for evidence, right? So there's, there, there would usually be an ophthalmologist, an epidemiologist, a biostatistician, in some instances, even a health economist, um, um, somebody who's an expert in the synthesis of evidence, right? But this, that, that's usually covered by the epidemiologist already. So the GDG, the guided development group, would be that set of experts. The, ex the stakeholders, these are individuals now who would actually try to, it's, it's not really to, to, to dictate, but in a way try to guide as to the direction of the CPG. So the stakeholders here now, as, as you mentioned, um, would now include your patients. There, there's always usually a patient representative, your allied health professionals, maybe optometrists, opticians, I, I don't know, maybe, you know, health professionals also interact with their patients, somebody from government. So in my experience with substance use disorders, we have um, representatives from different um, treatment and rehabilitation centers, Bikutan, Tagaytay, etc. So we have that policymakers from the DOH, stuff like that. So it can be very varied. Okay, so in here, the stakeholders group now will answer questions about applicability of, uh, of the questions. Are, they, uh, are the questions that are posing, are they comprehensive enough? Are they inclusive and diverse enough? Right? Because you want to have several viewpoints. So, so those are the two, um, two, two groups that you need to, to develop, and they're different. So you can't you can't really expect, for example, a patient to be assessing evidence, right? Unless, of course, that patient, you know, mas we have a patient who's an epidemiologist, but then that's usually a rarity, right? But in general, right, a patient who's a non-MD, for example, a non-MD, non-scientist, or, you know, has nothing to do with the health sciences, you wouldn't expect that patient to be reviewing evidence for you. So, but their, their viewpoint as to the relevance, the inclusivity, uh, for example, or the applicability of the, of, of, of the recommendations would come in. And, and even the ranking, for example, of the outcomes. Uh, so their, their, their opinion would, would, would be very important too. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments on that. 
Um, so when we have this, we have a when we're starting to come out with a clinical practice guideline, of course we cannot. We we try to answer or ask as many questions as we can, but of course, it because it gets more extensive as we have more questions, and sometimes even if you ask a question, we may not have enough evidence to answer that question, and like you said, sometimes the answer may be a uh, no recommendation to that question. So yeah. Uh this happened to me, you know, this happens to me very, very commonly uh, with the specialty societies who were kind enough, uh, who were crazy enough to enlist my help. I recall uh, I, I, I assisted a, a specialty society in 2014 develop their first uh, CPG on uh, on a particular condition. So the first the first task that they had was to, can you list all the questions you need to ask in, in the CPG? And they gave me 150 questions. Like, how can you develop a CPG addressing 150 questions? But when I reviewed the question, some questions were like about the epidemiology, for example, of the disease. Like, like what is the incidence or what are the risk factors, etc. So those questions are not management questions. So the only questions you need to ask in a CPG are management questions. Questions that are answerable by a yes or a no or a maybe. Right, so that's one way for you to to shorten the questions. Um, you just usually assign a team or a committee, just one committee, to address all the background questions. Questions about, you know, kasi kailangan mo rin naman ng situation there in a way, di ba? So for cataract, you might have questions about incidents, risk factors, protective factors, etc. So that's usually just one chapter. You can just assign that to one committee but what you need to focus on when you're developing a cpg would be management questions actionable questions do i offer this do i do i implement this test etc okay and if you you're able to to uh what they call this to to weed out the background for the from the foreground question so again going back to my very very first lecture background and foreground question if we're, if we're going to if we're able to weed out the the, the foreground questions from the background questions, then you'll have a relatively uh, manageable number of clinical questions to ask. So again, questions about epidemiology, don't need appraisal for that. Questions about risk factors, don't even need a systematic review for that. But questions about, do I offer this treatment? Do I offer this test, et cetera? That's when you, you, know, you, 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 you devote an entire committee or subcommittee for that. And uh, of course, I thank you for the, for the answer. Um, of course, another limitation of the CPGs is that um, you're basing the recommendations on the evidences available. Um, of course, new, new evidence will always come out uh, in the pipeline. And then sometimes some of the recommendations that you may have for a particular CPG may will change uh, in the course of time. So, uh, it's also worthy to when we when we cite or when we um, uh, give out information about a CPG. We also have to mention how long it's been made because uh, how long ago it was made because otherwise their their recommendation may not hold already by the time that you want to cite that information to somebody else. So. Uh, it needs to be constantly updated or you just have to make another CPG once you have new evidence comes out. Maybe uh, in the context maybe of COVID, if you look at the, their recommendations, of course, there's no CPG for COVID, right? But if you look at their, their suggestions two years ago, a lot has changed in the span of two years in the management of COVID. So because of new, a lot of... Um, uh, clinical tests have been made and done over the span of two years. A lot of uh, changes in management also have been done. So a lot with other medical conditions, things will come, always come out in some part of the country and sometimes it will be followed and uh, we'll have to change some of the things that we do. That's why they call it a living CPG. Yeah, yeah, if, you're, if you're familiar with the PISMID, DOH, 
um, leaving CPG on COVID-19. It just means that they're constantly updating it as evidence uh, becomes available. So it's like a mach an entire machinery actually that's operating just to be up updating that, that CPG. Yeah, yeah, it's an evolving thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we don't have any questions from our chat box. Um, I think uh, at this point, I'd like to remind everyone to please fill out the evaluation forms. We'll only be accepting responses until one hour after the end of the session. Again, let me remind you that this bootcamp consists of four modules and we'll be giving out certificates per module for the participants with complete attendance. For your co-residents, colleagues, and consultants who were not able to watch this live, this broadcast may be seen on PAO Facebook page, YouTube, and soon in the PAO app. The slides of the lectures and the handouts were generously given by Dr. Amiel, and the link will be posted weekly in the PAO Viber group. Once again, thank you, Amiel, and uh, to everyone for joining us on this Sunday morning. I would like to personally thank the Research Bootcamp Committee members, Dr. Jatrael, Ruel Villanueva, and Paul Gomez, and our staff member, Joshua Puti, for helping organize this event. I'd like to thank the PAO Executive Council, headed by President Julio Campo, the Research Committee, and the Executive Council for being supportive of this project. We have eight more exciting episodes in store for you. So we'll see you again next week, April 31, 8 a.m. for the start of module two on research methods. So do you have any other words for us, Amiel? None at this point, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I haven't realized it's already, the, we're already done with module one. I, I hope you still have the, the same enthusiasm for module two. This one is on our research methods. So it's a totally different take uh, in a way, but I really do hope that you're able to learn a, a thing or two about appraisal or maybe refresh, refresh your, 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 your mind or your, refresh your knowledge on how to appraise medical literature. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amiel. Uh, we'll see you again. Please take care and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Have a blessed Sunday and keep safe. Uh, bye for now.